All right. It's good to see some familiar names as well as some newcomers. Welcome. Let's go ahead and begin. Uh, my name is Sunil Prasad. Uh, I am one of the uh, PhD students here in the Stanford Religious Studies Department. I want to welcome everyone to the second of five Potomac mini lectures uh, for this academic year. Uh, this Potomac series showcases senior as well as exceptional junior faculty. And instead of delivering a traditional research presentation, as we would typically expect, uh, we've asked presenters to use the classroom lecture as their model. Uh, we've budgeted exactly one hour for this event. And during the presentation, we ask that you please do take advantage of the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. My colleague in the program who oversees the Potomac series, Anu Jameen, will make an appearance at the end of the lecture to field our questions and present them to our speaker. Now we are in for a hell of a time for tonight's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, sorry, bad joke. I have been practicing that one all day. I love a good help. Um, <laughs> we're privileged to have with us Dr. Megan Henning, who is Associate Professor of Christian Origins at the University of Dayton. She's the author of numerous publications, including her most recent book, Hell Hath No Fury, Gender, Disability, and the Invention of Damned Bodies in Early Christian Literature. In addition to the numerous awards and recognition of her outstanding contributions to the field, uh, she's also made numerous appearances in media outlets like National Geographic and CNN. Tonight, she'll be taking us on an exciting journey to hell. Uh, and with that, I pass the virtual microphone on to you, Dr. Henning. Uh, thank you again uh, for your time this evening. Thank you so much, Sunny, and thank you so much to Stanford University's Department of Religious Studies, to Michael Penn and Anu Jamin for organizing this wonderful lecture series and for inviting me to talk about hell. Thank you to Sunny Prasad for hosting this evening. It is an honor to be with you all, and I'm grateful to everyone who has chosen to take the time to listen this evening. To start our time together, I'm going to give you a brief outline of how this is going to go. So I want to start by looking at the question that has preoccupied scholarship on hell, and that is, who made hell? Then I want to think about why it is that we care so much about answers to that question. And finally, we're going to think about what was at stake specifically for late ancient Christians when they made hell. So our opening question, who made hell? So here you see Botticelli's rendering of Dante's Nine Circles of Hell, and many of the images in Dante's Inferno are what we all call to mind when we hear talk of hell. Fire, punishments that fit the crime in some way, or retributive justice, and a hierarchy of sins. I've placed it next to a poster for American Horror Story because there is a popular fan theory, which the creators of the show have confirmed that each season of American Horror Story represents one of Dante's circles of hell. This popular series revisits each season the idea that people are tortured in some way for their ethical missteps. But people were thinking about the unpleasant afterlife scenarios long before American Horror Story, or even before Dante. Scholars of late antiquity have been very aware of this, since many of the ideas that inspired Dante came from late antique texts, like the early fifth century Apocalypse of Paul, which Dante says that he read just before he wrote the Inferno. So how did we get these apocalyptic visions of hell? Ideas of afterlife torture and punishment, where did they come from? Who was the first person to imagine this? 19th and 20th century scholarship on the afterlife was very focused on this question. So spoiler alert, I'm going to give you the short answer. The short answer is that lots of people made hell. It's a big knot. And unfortunately, as historians, we can't totally untangle it as a result. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of some of the big ideas in this conversation, but as I do, I'm going to ask you to hold in your mind that short answer that I just gave you, and also to keep in mind that these different cultures and texts do not progress linearly from one to another, but influence each other and sometimes existed simultaneously. So we'll start with Egypt. Egypt's ideas of the afterlife have an elaborate death culture that is rooted in geography. As we know, the Nile Valley is fertile land that's flanked on either side by lifeless desert. 
the valley and the land were understood to be products of the gods. Osiris, for example, is the peace-loving vegetation and fertility god. There's a sharp contrast between cultivation in the fertile space around the river and order versus chaos. And that carries on into the thought about the afterlife. There's a continuity in Egyptian thought between life and death. There are happy, lighthearted people who love life and the tomb paintings depict an abundant life. The next life, they think, is like this one, but so much better. There's evidence from the Book of the Dead, which are papyri, pyramid texts, and coffin texts that all corroborates this picture of how people thought about life, death, and life after death in ancient Egypt. The notion of second death, though it sounds scary, is part of this notion of continuity. The second death was a divine judgment where you would not make it past the land of the dead to the halls of Osiris. In the picture that's on the slide in front of you, you can see the scales of Osiris where each person's deeds would be weighed. That is what you did in this life would impinge upon the next. The hearts of the righteous were thought to be no heavier than a feather when placed on this scale. So if your heart was heavier than a feather, you might experience the second death. This is for the wicked and it's a fiery torment. You're thrown into a fiery lake, but it's not exactly eternal punishment. It's a one-time destruction. You exist and then your soul stops existing after the second death. The Book of the Dead and the Coffin Text gave ancient Egyptians spells that they could use to avoid this judgment and to navigate successfully the afterlife. Like the Egyptians, the Greeks and Romans believed that everybody went to the same place with a few exceptional cases and that your journey there required assistance. The depictions of Hades that we get in Greek and Latin literature takes the format of a journey or a tour. It, in these tours, they explain the terrain and help the tourist and the audience interpret everything that they're seeing and its significance. The tour guides themselves indicate just by their very presence the difficulty of the route. Needing a tour guide implies that death is becoming perhaps less natural and that there's need for someone who knows the way. Now, as I mentioned, everyone goes to the same place, Hades. And not everyone there is punished. In fact, the bulk of Odyssey 11, Odysseus's tour of Hades, involves people that he knew and loved in his life. He sees his mother, his beloved friends, and only a small section of the tour is devoted to the famous punishments for the Titans. This is where we see Sisyphus, who you might be familiar with, forever pushing his rock up that hill. It's at the end of that tour that we also get some punishments that fit the crime. This idea of punishments that fit the crime or lex talionis, the law of talion, or you might be able to hear in the Latin, the word retaliation, right? Um, it's the law of retaliation that the punishment might somehow fit the crime in measure or intensity. It comes from the earliest Roman law code in 450 BCE, but the idea is much older. Punishments like this were less common in Roman law and more often talked about in the afterlife. In Plato's laws, for example, murderers are punished in Hades and then they return to earth to be murdered by other people. In the comedian Lucian's text, The Menippus, this one is perhaps my think the most interesting example of measure for measure punishment, the rich are turned into donkeys and they are forced to carry around the poor for 250 years. So you have a reversal of fortunes, a measure for measure punishment, and because Lucian's a comedian, it's also somewhat humorous. But the good news is that it has a limit. After 250 years, they get to go back about their business. Um, when we move to ancient Judaism, unlike Greek and Roman portrayals of the afterlife, the earliest Jewish ideas of the afterlife did not include punishment, but death, and stuff, and death itself instead was viewed very negatively. So we have what I am calling the life and death contrast in the Hebrew Bible. 
Within this contrast, death could be understood or talked about in two different ways. You have biological death, which is what we all understand when we talk about death, the cessation of your, your heartbeat and your bodily functions. Or you could have a qualitative death, which is the absence of human flourishing and wisdom. We see examples of this idea present, for example, in the tradition of the two ways that we find in wisdom literature in the Hebrew Bible. And it's within this, so the, the tradition of the two ways, if you're not familiar, is the idea that you could follow lady wisdom and follow the path of righteousness that leads to life and human flourishing, or you could fall, you could abandon lady wisdom and follow the path of the wicked. Um, and then you would experience qualitative death, if not a premature death um, in this lifetime. So it's within this idea of a life and death contrast or the tradition of the two ways that death and the spaces of the dead are talked about and understood in ancient Judaism. So when you see references to Sheol, for example, in the Hebrew Bible um, that seem negative, uh, it's Sheol is still a place where all of the dead go, like Hades, and it's shadowy, dark, dusty, and damp. But it's drawn into these contexts that seem somewhat negative rhetorically or poetically because you still don't want to go to Sheol, and you definitely don't want to go there prematurely. For example, in the book of Isaiah 38, King Hezekiah, after recovering from a sickness, says that he is at the end of his life and is consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of his life. Here, King Hezekiah is reflecting upon Sheol as an afterlife space, but one that he's not particularly excited to get to. Um, and in particular, he associates it with the end of the flourishing and happy part of his life. The pit like Sha'ol is described similarly, and like Sha'ol is used poetically and rhetorically to talk about death, particularly the idea that we all die, but don't want to die prematurely or experience a qualitative death. And we'll see, you see references to the pit and Sheol even sometimes together in texts like the Psalms. Now I have Gehenna on this slide, but I wanna give a disclaimer that in the Hebrew Bible and the majority of ancient Judaism, Gehenna is not an afterlife space. Um, I'm mentioning it here because it does, it originates, the concept originates in the Hebrew Bible um, and during the second temple period begins to be associated with afterlife spaces. Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom is a real place. It's originally associated with the geographic place where fire and child sacrifice were also thought to happen. And you can see a picture of the valley today. It's the valley currently known as the Wadi Arabah running south to southwest of Jerusalem. The association with fire then precedes the association with the afterlife. As I mentioned, Gehenna is not an afterlife space in the Hebrew Bible, but a valley that was associated with fire. In 1st Enoch 27 too, Gehenna is a cursed valley. So 1st Enoch, a uh, second temple Jewish apocalypse describes Gehenna as a cursed valley where those who utter with their mouth an improper word against the Lord are gathered. There's no mention of fire in first Enoch, but that's probably because the association between Gehenna and fire was already well established by this point. So in this apocalyptic text, we have it being used as an otherworldly space of judgment and punishment. And I just wanna add here before we move on from Gehenna in particular, there's a, th an, a theory or an idea that pops up particularly in popular teachings, especially sermons, that Gehenna was a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. Um, it wasn't a garbage dump in the first century CE. So I just wanna clear that up. I get asked about that a bit. Um, there was a medieval rabbinic commentator who hypothesizes the garbage dump theory and it really takes off. But there's no literary or archaeological evidence for this in the Second Temple or Rabbinic periods. Okay, so now we're going to turn to early Christian depictions of the afterlife. Specifically, um, we'll start with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the weeping and gnashing of teeth and outer darkness are in both Luke and Matthew. But Matthew uses it differently, kind of like a refrain a depressing and scary refrain. 
In Luke, it's a natural emotional response. In Matthew, it's a vivid description of a place of punishment that's meant to instruct the audience and persuade them emotionally. For Matthew, judgment and punishment are always on the horizon, and thus one needs to get down to doing kingdom things and not wicked things. In the New Testament, Gehenna and Hades are used interchangeably. These terms are never juxtaposed in a single context. And yet when an author does use both terms, they appear to do so somewhat interchangeably. Hades is juxtaposed with heaven in the New Testament texts, and both terms are drawn into contexts of judgment and punishment. So sometime in the second temple period and definitely by the first century CE when many of our New Testament documents are written, we start to see a move towards thinking about something like hell. Ethical action is the emphasis of all the major New Testament passages on hell. The sheep and the goats, for example, in Matthew 25, the goats go to hell and those who did not feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, visit the sick or the imprisoned are the goats. The sheep who go to heaven do all of those things. So in Matthew 25, care for the least of these is the ethical standard. And hell, or this parable that juxtaposes goats and sheep who go to hell and heaven respectively, is meant to persuade the audience to take up those activities, to feed the hungry, to welcome the stranger, to visit the sick and the imprisoned. In Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, we see the rich man crying out to Lazarus from the flames of hell. He wants Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers. Here we have Lazarus in heaven and the rich man in Hades. And it reminds us a bit of Lucian's story where the poor are going around on the backs of rich asses in Hades. It's a reversal of fortune story, an admonition about the dangers of wealth and not caring for the poor. And like the story with the donkeys, it's not one that's very easy to forget. It sticks with you, and so does the ethical lesson. In Revelation 19 to 20, ethical deeds are once again the central focus of the teaching. Here, ethical deeds determine whose name is written in the book of life or who experiences the second death and the lake of fire. And we do see in that text a similar motif to what we have in the Egyptian text that we started with, right? We have this idea of second death and a lake of fire and a person's righteousness on earth is what determines their fate in the afterlife. Although instead of a scale and a feather, we've got the book of life. The ancient Jewish and early Christian tours of hell carry on this ethical emphasis that we see in the New Testament texts. These texts are the texts that influence Dante. When people think about hell today, this is the kind of thing they imagine. Fiery, compartmentalized, measure for measure punishments. These are the texts where the popular, that were popular in late antiquity that have scholars puzzling over, where did this come from? Many have tried to tease this apart, but we have to be very careful here. Jews and Christians are developing their thinking alongside one another at this point and with influence from other ancient cultures. So I'll just, the, a number of them are on the slide for you. This isn't all of the texts, but many of them. Um, First Enoch 22 is the earliest um, and is a, a Jewish apocalypse. Second Enoch 8 to 10, and in First Enoch 22, I should say, you don't have a tour of hell. What you have is an afterlife space that looks more like um, a compartmentalized waiting room where people who behaved in different ways on earth are awaiting different post-resurrection fates. But we have there a distinction between different kinds of people who will have different afterlife fates. And some of them are not good. In Second Enoch 8 to 10, we have something more like um, a tour of hell where there's specific punishments associated with specific sins, but Second Enoch is a difficult text to classify. Um, and most people think instead of it being a Jewish apocalypse, at least the text that we have now um, in the Ethiopic is probably a Christian apocalypse. We have a number of early Christian apocalypses all named after different saints who tore hell. 
the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apocalypse of Paul, the Apocalypse of Ezra, and the, there's two Apocalypses of Ezra, the Greek and the Latin, and we also have the Greek Apocalypse of Mary. There are also tours that are embedded in other types of texts. So the Acts of Thomas, for example, contains a tour of hell, even though the Acts of Thomas is not itself an apocalypse. And the Dormition narratives of Mary, um, all of these stories about the assumption of Mary into heaven contain Mary touring hell as well, or having some kind of a vision or experience with hell at the end before she goes to heaven. There are also fragmentary tours um, that are associated with the prophets, the Isaiah and the Ezra fragments. And then I, as I emphasized at the outset, when I started talking about these texts, um, the, these are the texts that influence Dante, um, particularly the Apocalypse of Paul, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Um, but one of the things that we notice when we're looking at all of these texts, particularly Second Enoch on, is that the intensity and amount of violent punishments in these texts is dramatically ramped up from earlier texts and cultures. To be sure, earlier Roman texts contain some violent punishments, but nothing like the late antique tours of hell. Now, I wanna admit, as we look back at our outline, we've finished point one, I have left out a lot here. This is just a quick overview of who made hell. But it shows you that no single ancient group has a monopoly on infernal thinking. And more importantly, it shows that while other cultures attached the idea of punishment to the afterlife, in late antiquity, there's a dramatic increase in the intensity and amount of violent, violent punishment that we find in hell. That dramatic shift is part of the answer to our next question. Why do we care about this question of origins or how it all started? The first possibility has something to do simply with method. It's really just how historians did history at this point in scholarship. Um, a post enlightenment set of questions that fueled history of religion scholarship was in part, when did it begin? We wanted to trace ideas back to their origins. Especially though, when it comes to hell with the discovery and publication of the Greek fragments of the second century apocalypse of Peter near the end of the 19th century by Albrecht Dietrich. There, Dietrich was determined to, to demonstrate specifically that the apocalypse of Peter was demonstrating for us that early Christian notions of hell were borrowing specifically from Orphic, Orphic and Pythagorean traditions. So there, the focus was naturally on discovery and specifically using this new discovery to trace the history of an idea to its origin. Some of the reasons that we care about why it started though are also theological. This question about who made hell can work to distance particular traditions from ideas that are violent and ethically problematic, essentially placing the blame elsewhere for this kind of icky idea. For good reason, every single time I have lectured about this topic for the last eight years, I get asked whether hell really exists or not. People are cosmologically curious, likely because of the harm that the idea of hell has done and can do. And because of enlightenment consciousness, this methodological curiosity that I just mentioned, we believe that historical and scientific study of these ancient texts will somehow reveal to us whether or not hell is real. And I have to tell you, unfortunately, that it doesn't. That's not something that history can tell us. Um, so in addition to theology, oh, and I should mention too, um, one of the ways that we can see, especially in early 20th century scholarship, this kind of theological motivation is um, in the work of Rudolf Bultmann, the New Testament and it along with Wilhelm Bousset to associate the idea of hell with Greek and Roman or pagan sources um, because it was really important for him that the idea of hell not be a part of the essential theological kernel of Christianity. Um, and so we see that at the beginning of, um, of Boltmann's New Testament theology and in the work of Bousset and notice that even for these, these rigorous historians of the early 20th century, 
theology played a role in why it was that they were asking who's, who made hell. We also just have a general aversion to apocalyptic literature in the history of scholarship. Even for scholars who had no interest whatsoever in trying to scrub their own tradition of this idea, apocalyptic literature and apocalypticism were seen as banal, popular, unsophisticated literature of the masses. So for all these reasons, the primary questions that scholars and the general public have asked about hell have fallen under this umbrella of where did it come from or who made hell? But an important shift has occurred in the last 10 to 15 years, moving us to think seriously about hell rhetorically. The rhetorical or linguistic turn, as we sometimes call it in afterlife studies, asks instead, what are people doing when they talk about hell? A good example of this with respect to heaven in afterlife studies would be the work of Candida Moss um, and her book, Divine Bodies, is a great extended reflection on what is heaven doing? It's important to note that when I talk about the rhetorical turn, that this move is not reductive. I'm not saying that heaven or hell is just rhetoric, but acknowledging and respecting the power of language and rhetoric and its necessary connection to some part of reality in order to really work. So by now, you have probably already inferred from my demeanor that my own work and thinking is within the rhetorical or linguistic turn in afterlife studies. I'm most interested in asking questions about what hell does in late antiquity, which is not to say that I don't still think about questions of origins, I do. But I am asking these questions to build on the work of others and fill in the puzzle a bit more. And if you have studied historiography in your other coursework, that is historical methods or how it is that we construct history in different times and places, you can probably guess that as scholarship has moved in the direction of thinking about what are people doing when they ask about, when they make hell, we've also started to answer those other questions about where it came from. So asking about what is at stake when people talk about hell can oftentimes help us answer those other questions about where did hell come from. So now we're gonna to turn to the third part of our outline. What is it that hell does? What is at stake for those who make hell? And what does it do for late ancient Christians? There we go. Sorry, didn't mean to give you a slide whiplash. All right, so the first thing that hell does is educate. It educates and persuades audiences. And the way that it does that is through vivid visual rhetoric. We've already seen some of that with some of the examples that I've given you. The name in Greek rhetoric for visual rhetoric that is vivid is ekphrasis, or in the Latin, energeia. Ekphrasis, as Alias Theon, the rhetorician who wrote the, pro, the, um, the Progymnasmata, which is the word for the ancient rhetorical handbooks, he uses a, a very brief definition. Ekphrasis is descriptive language bringing what is portrayed clearly before the sight. There is ekphrasis of persons and events and places and periods of time, he says. So you can see that this vivid visual rhetoric can offer us definition, or can offer us description of a number of different things. And according to Quintilian, if a person uses vivid vi visual rhetoric correctly, the emotions will ensue just as if we were present at the event itself. Now, the way that this works is that the images have to be, have to have an essential quality of truthiness. They have to be believable and they have to be something that people can immediately call up to their mind without a lot of effort. So someone who's trying to use this vivid rhetoric would use common imagery that was part of people's everyday visual vocabulary, images that were familiar and readily available. There we go. All right. So 
one Greek, so one particular example from the Greek tradition about how hell can educate comes from Plutarch's Morelia. So, oh my, I keep skipping slides. I'm so sorry. There we go. Um, so Plutarch is describing the colors of the bruises that are left by various vices that DK attempts to heal through her punishments. One is drab brown, the stain that comes from meanness and greed. Another fiery blood red, which comes of cruelty and savagery. Where you see the blue gray, some form of incontinence in pleasure has been barely rubbed out. While if spite and envy are present, they give out this livid green as ink is ejected by the squid. What do you see when you look at this passage? Particularly, obviously all of the colors jump out, right? You can't forget, and we haven't forgotten, that green is associated with envy, right? There's a direct connection between specific vices and specific imagery and punishments. It's vivid visual imagery that you can't unsee. And this is especially important if you remember that ancient literacy rates and that people would primarily be hearing texts aloud rather than reading them themselves. Vices of the soul, according to Plutarch, cannot be hidden. And Pl Plutarch is persuading audiences not to hide their vices in this life, but to take care to eradicate them, because if they do not, they will be found out and healed through painless pun painful punishments in the next life. All right. So a Christian example of hell educating and persuading audiences comes from the tours of hell. The ethical rubric of the Sermon on the Mount, as I mentioned, has a central position in these texts. This is in part because of Matthew's influence on the apocalypse of Peter, but also this is in the Jewish apocalypses as well, because this is a, a central part of the Hebrew Bible um, tradition. The concern and care for the other um, is something that's a, a, a robust part of ancient Judaism. So we see this in, in all of these tours of hell that we, we get in late antiquity. And here's an example from um, the Book of Mary's Repose or the Liber Requi, um, one of the Dormition narratives. So Mary said, Lord, who is this who has a great punishment more terrible than the others and who receives no mercy at all? And the response comes back, Mary, this is a priest whom the poor, destitute, and afflicted trusted. And he ate the memorials and first offerings. And not only by himself, but he gave them to those who were not worthy. And because of this, they beat him in his face. This example from the book of Mary's repose includes a priest who ate up the offerings and did not care for the poor and who is beaten beyond recognition. But the text goes on to emphasize that his face never dissolves, showing the audience that neglecting the care for the other renders one fragmented and unrecognizable for eternity. The apocalypse of Paul 40 has similar punishments for those who wear monastic garments, but don't care for wid widows, orphans, strangers, or the poor. In these tours, the vivid visual rhetoric of punishment is meant to persuade readers to behave according to early Christian ethical standards. There we go. In addition to educating and persuading audiences, hell can also tell us how authors understand themselves and their world. Ellen Muhlenberger's work is really helpful for this, for thinking about the moment of death and how imagining death and punishment is part of speech and character as a rhetorical exercise, but also shows us something about um, how people understood themselves and their world. Tertullian, a second century African church father writing from Carthage imagines his theological opponents, the Valentinians, in hell. For Tertullian, hell reflects the tension that he has between himself and those he identifies as heterodox. Augustine, in the fourth century in North Africa, a church father who is very concerned about a different set of opponents, the compassionate Christians, as he calls them. He says, these people are wrong because hell, if hell is not scary enough, then it won't really work. And he's particularly concerned about people who imagine there to be a way out. So we think that he's probably talking about some of the early Christian apocalypses in which there might be a few days of respite for the damned or even 
a complete obliteration of damnation altogether. So in City of God, Augustine says that some, for some offenses, lex talionis, or measure for measure punishment, is not severe enough. These people have to be punished for eternity, he says. Hell, for Augustine, is about balancing the scales, about cosmic justice. He also connects eternal punishment in hell with the criminal justice system, connecting it to Cicero's, a famous Roman statesman's, eight kinds of justice under the law. For John Chrysostom, a fourth century archbishop of Constantinople, known especially for his preaching, hell is something that he wishes he could always preach about because he says it's so educationally beneficial for my audience. And he even goes on to say, to cite specific instances of particular sins that benefit especially from preaching about hell. For each of these authors who were writing in very different contexts with different perspectives, one of the key values that we see emerging is a conflation between hell's punishments and earthly punitive justice. Chrysostom, for example, says that hell is like the mines, only worse. He says, but as those who work in the mines are delivered over to certain cruel men and see none of the people they live with, but only their overseers, so will it be then also, or rather not so, but even far more cruel. For here it is possible to go unto the king and entreat and free the condemned person, but there no longer, since it is not permitted but they continue in the scorching torment and in such great bodily pain as it is not possible for words to tell. Here, as I'm thinking about the carceral imagery of late antiquity and the way that it influenced Christian imaginations of hell alongside Chrysostom, who makes that comparison explicit, I'm grateful for the work of Matthew Larson and Mark Lettany and very much looking forward to their forthcoming books on ancient prisons. Eusebius of Caesarea claims that during the Great Persecution, Christians were dispatched to the mines at Fino, modern-day Quebec Fainan, in southwest Jordan as their punishment. The damnatio ad metallum, or condemnation to the mines sentence, was among the harshest penalties in Roman law and was ordinarily reserved for members of the lower classes and enslaved persons. Mines were perceived as places where prisoners rarely saw light frequently suffocated from noxious gases, were vulnerable to being crushed by piles of falling rocks, and were exposed to extreme heat and physical exhaustion. The lower a prisoner would descend, the more oppressive and dangerous his experience would be. Late ancient Christian tours of hell use the space and conditions of the mines to imagine hell. When they do this, they lower the status of those elites whose punishments bring them there. So hell works as a way to draw boundaries. Early Christians may have been later to the hell game, but they are by far the most enthusiastic, expanding and intensifying the carceral imagery of hell. Adamantine bars, as you may know, were already part of Hades imagery in Roman depictions, like Virgil in the Aeneid. He describes hell as having adamantine bars. But early Christians greatly expand this. For example, in Roman judicial nightmares, some of the things people would fear would be imprisonment, hanging, beheading, being thrown to wild beasts, crucifixion, or burning alive. Hell has all of these punishments except crucifixion. Hell not only draws boundaries by using earthly images of prison and torture, it also labels and humiliates the people that we find there. In the Apocalypse of Paul 42, for example, those who deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus are in a place of ice and snow. Now, a cold day in hell, it turns out, is not the anomaly that we might infer from our colloquialisms. It's just another bad place. Just before this, in chapter 41, the worst and smelliest place in hell is reserved for those who have not confessed the incarnation or those who deny the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So in both chapters 41 and 42 of the Apocalypse of Paul, we see hell drawing and reinforcing confessional lines. 
And in late antique hell, we get Christians using amped up tortures of the Roman empire to do that boundary work. Sometimes the punishments that they use are the same ones that were used against the martyrs to police doctrinal boundaries this time. One of the other things that hell's sins and punishments can do is delineate sins and assign blame. So they not only shift to label and reinforce different doctrinal boundaries in different texts, but they also define and redefine sins and the people held accountable for them. Different Christian tours of hell contain different sins and punishments. And the punishments for different sins or even for the same sin can change over time. Put simply, there's tremendous power here in these texts because they frame sin for the audience. But in doing so, they are frequently reflecting or intensifying the social norms of when and where they are written. So I have two examples on this slide for you next to each other so that you can compare them with me. So um, you notice that there's the same punishment um, and these are both focused on adultery. In the first text, the second century Apocalypse of Peter, we see that adultery is initiated by a woman through misleading dress. So you see that um, women are first singled out, and then we see that these are the ones who braid braids. And it's not for a beautiful disposition, but specifically for the purpose of committing adultery. So Apocalypse of Peter, in the second century is reflecting Roman ideas about adultery in which men could have sex with women who were not their wives, and it was not considered adultery, as long as those women weren't married women of high status, known as matronas. And how you dressed was one way to tell a woman's status. This is something, as I mentioned, that Tertullian was really worried about, because if women weren't dressing properly, you could accidentally commit adultery and not know it. In this system, of sexual morality, adultery is seen as an interruption of the household order. And it's primarily seen as a slight against another man, a theft of another man's property. And that's why it's only problematic if the woman is married. Now at the end of Apocalypse of Peter 7, you notice that men are also punished. And they say, we did not know that we would come into eternal punishment, probably reflecting this concern about misleading dress. Um, but also reflecting a partial Christian critique of the idea that women were exclusively to blame. Though reading this text alongside others indicates that women are still mostly to blame here. And that's why they're singled out first. By the fifth century with the apocalypse of Paul, we have the same punishment, but men are mentioned first and right alongside women. And we also get this distinctive phrase down here at the, at the bottom where, um, their own husbands and wives. This is the first time in punishments for adultery that the offended spouses are mentioned at all. We have a shift here to seeing sexual morality as an offense against another person and a shift away from a Roman system of sexual morality in which male adulterers were accountable to other men and not really their own wives. In short, even though adultery is punished in both of these texts, who is responsible, to whom they are accountable, and why changes. And it's bound up in the gender norms of the broader society and the church. This is just one example, but it shows us the way that hell can be used to reinforce ideas about culpability for sin and to rewire Christian ideas about right and wrong as they shifted. Hell doesn't merely police boundaries using the carceral technologies of earth. It appears to have influenced them. In the Theodosian Code, the fifth century Christian compilation of Roman law, the hell of the early Christian apocalypses comes to earth. In this text, the nurses who neglected their charges have boiling lead poured down their throats, mirroring the breast milk beast punishments of the ancient hellscapes like the apocalypse of Peter, in which women who aborted or exposed their children were attacked by beasts made out of their own putrid breast milk. In another law in this text, passive partners of homoerotic couplings are burned and have their hands, feet, and tongues amputated. <laughs> 
this Christian compilation of Roman law makes hell's punishments a reality on earth. And while it might be shocking to see the way that late ancient Christian visions of hell impacted earthly laws and justice systems, I think the study of the rhetoric of hell offers us important takeaways and points of reflection for today. In our short time together, we've come a long way from the outset of this talk where we looked at afterlife spaces that were mostly neutral or even the earliest Christian hell texts that focused on the virtues of the Sermon on the Mount or care for the other. And while a pastoral figure like John Chrysostom thought that the rhetoric of hell was a justified means because it could be educational, we can also see that depictions of hell tapped into and expanded Roman notions of punitive justice and perhaps brought them forward to our own society. So to return to the question of where did hell come from, where we started, while other cultures might have had a hand in crafting unpleasant afterlives, it is late antique Christians who gave us the hell we know best today, adopting Roman ideas about criminal justice, punishment, gender, and the body to create visually persuasive scenes of eternal punishment. We might like to think that this is very far removed from our own world. But hell keeps popping up in the media with shows like American Horror Story, Lucifer, and The Good Place. And even when we as a culture aren't explicitly making hells of our own, like the ones that late ancient Christians did, we are surrounded by punitive logics. We still largely think of criminal justice according to punitive models and use the bodily norms of our culture to create boundaries and police bodies often in gendered, ableist, and racist ways. We see this all over the place, from something as simple as school dress codes to more complicated and serious issues like criminal justice and medical charting and diagnosis. And in a global pandemic, we are confronted daily by images and talking points that externalize fears of sickness onto disabled bodies and offer them up as an acceptable sacrifice. It is my greatest hope that thinking about the rhetorical function of late ancient hells will help us think more carefully about how to avoid bringing these kinds of hells to earth. Thank you. All right, well, Professor, thank you so much. And as always, I like to give everyone an, a round of applause. I know that, that everyone is clapping from the other side of their screens. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I also so also just want to let everyone know that if you have any questions to so just drop them in the chat. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left and we'd be more than happy to field those questions for you. Um, but to jump right in, I do want to start off with one question um, and something that I was thinking throughout your presentation. Um, you know, this might seem like a very basic question, but the conception of early Christians they're in, in their universe says um, you know, to general what community you're speaking about, um, the idea of demons was really prevalent. Mm -hmm. And I'm really kind of curious as to like what the relationship in late antiquity was between hell, as it may have been imagined across various communities, and demons. I mean, oftentimes it's kind of purported that hell is kind of the home of demons, but I, I wanted to mm -hmm. hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, we certainly see that a lot in, in later depictions. In the Depictions that we get from late antiquity specifically, um, you get punishing angels um, in hell, and but they're not labeled as demons. And so that's one of the things we, you, and you also have, but you have in a number of other texts, um, I'm thinking mostly of monastic literature, but you, I mean, so you have, right, in David Brackey's work, for example, um, on earth, definitely the demonic is associated with negative afterlife spaces, but, and, but it's, it, demons seem to mostly have their place on earth um, and less to do specifically with an unpleasant afterlife once you get there. <laughs> they might take you there um, or they might lead you down the wrong path. Um, but in the depictions, the most, the most extended depictions of hell, we don't get demons yet. Okay, okay. Um, 
All right. Well, that, I mean, that's an awesome, awesome response. That was actually really interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to take another question here that says, um, in light of the punitive aspects of hell imagined by those in late antiquity, were there any ideas that physical or spiritual punishment could be rehabilitated or have another purpose besides the lex talionis? That is a great question. Um, so the, <laughs> yes. Um, so Plutarch, for example, the text that I showed you from Plutarch in the, in, so in the Greek tradition, there's definitely this idea, right? DK punishes the souls so that they can be healed and go back to earth. Um, so there's definitely in Greek and Latin traditions already this idea that exists of the punishment being rehabilitative. Um, and we get, for example, in the Apocalypse of Zephaniah, which I forgot to mention, there's, that is a text where um, the punishment has itself a, a possible rehabilitative function. Um, you also have, besides rehabilitation, um, you also have this idea that we saw with Tertullian of simply wanting to imagine your enemies <laughs> there, right, um, as a way of um, drawing clear lines about, and so, and, but we also think that that possibly has a, um, a kind of, some scholars hypothesize it has a kind of cathartic effect too. Um, but then there's also the whole descensus tradition of people, of saints, of Jesus, and then of saints descending to hell to do some kind of salvific work. So on the one hand, we have people like Augustine who are talking about how hell has to be super serious and severe so that um, the cosmic justice scales can be balanced. But then we also have um, these traditions that exist where um, Jesus or another saint um, harrows hell by redeeming the people that are present there. And one of the most interesting examples of this is that um, the later Marian apocalypses have Mary actually asking if she, and also this happens in some of the Ezra texts, but Mary asks if she's allowed to suffer with the damned or in their place. So um, we have this interesting, and that's a really cool place because then we have Mary kind of querying this tradition that's typically Jesus or male saints doing the salvific work of going to hell and rescuing the damned. But Mary in her, in her unique position as the mother of Jesus has this special ability to intervene for the damned as they're both their intercessor and then kind of as doing the salvific work of standing with them in their suffering. Okay, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn a little bit more toward the beginning of your lecture where you kind of mm -hmm. explored previous afterlives. Um, mm -hmm. and there was a question posed here and one that I'm personally also super curious about. Um, I mean, you fielded uh, Greco-Roman conceptions of the afterlife, Jewish conceptions of the afterlife and Egyptian conceptions of the afterlife. But in late antiquity, there were also conceptions formed by Zoroastrians. We see different Manichaean beliefs, we see different Gnostic beliefs. How do we kind of take into consideration this multifaceted environment when talking mm -hmm. about a single phenomenon, right? Like, right. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I tried to be really, I tried to really give as much nuance as possible while also having individual slides <laughs> yeah. about these traditions. Yeah, yeah. How do you do um, because they really do inform each other and it's very, very hard to tease apart. So yes, the Zoroastrian stuff is really important and it may have influenced these other traditions um, for sure. Um, one of the things that is difficult around those texts is dating. I believe a number of like, and this is true actually, it's not just those texts. It's a lot of the texts that I talked about this evening where the manuscript evidence that we have is relatively late, like from the medieval period um, or early modern period, but we think it is a much, much earlier text. So um, there's definitely Zoroastrian influence. And I think um, Seth Sanders has a really great article on the early earliest Jewish tour of hell. I think that's actually the title of the article um, <laughs> that um, also talks a bit about this. Um, as well as he and I had an exchange about it on a Twitter thread feed <laughs> a little while ago. So um, yeah, but I think that that's absolutely, I did, like I said, I did not cover all of the possible antecedents for this concept at all. I gave sort of the big ones that typically get tossed out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are so many. Um, uh, so I, I know, I, I completely understand that. I've, I'm kind of interested in that area as well. Um, so I'll, one more question that I did have here is that, you know, does magic kind of relate to hell? 
late ancient conceptions of magic? And if so, through ritual, how, how do you how do you kind of interact with the infernal while you're living? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, so we don't have a lot of um we don't have a lot of like clear evidence in terms of like people went to this one arche- you know so we know that for example in greek and roman tradition like there are places where they thought well this is the gate of hades and there you know there are geographic sites in greece and turkey that are associated with the hellmouth and that you you would go there and do specific things in, um in christianity we don't have that same thing um we have more of people um using amulets or prayer um, in on earth more generally to ward off like kind of general evil in general Mm -hmm. um and i i would be happy if people know of (laughs) of references that i don't know so i think that um that we have at least one or, or more resident magic experts in the audience so if you want to send me links to to <laughs> references that I don't know about I would love to know about that but th- there's not a lot mm-hmm. ritually that I know about that is specific in terms of being targeted at hell there's a concern because of the bifurcated afterlife at this point there's certainly a concern about getting yourself and your loved ones into heaven um but nothing that singles out the hell part of the afterlife aspect on its own. right yeah okay that that definitely makes sense um i do want to turn a little bit more toward this one question that we just received um and it is more yeah. than kind of the body in late antiquity um mm-hmm. and Great. i'm just going to read it word for word here it said you you said hell became more violent in antiquity does this have yeah. anything to do with corporeal doctrines in christianity specifically the incarnation or bodily resurrection it absolutely can yeah (laughs) it probably does i think it's both um i mean so there's at the beginning of the apocalypse of paul there's this really fascinating scene where um the souls as they're leaving their bodies before that uh as they die are being told by the angels that they need to take a really good look at their body because they don't want to get back in the wrong one when the resurrection happens oh that's crazy because the correct body has to receive the rewards or punishments, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. These same texts are very concerned with the idea of bodily resurrection, for sure. Okay, um, and especially in the Marian texts, the, the very strong focus on the incarnation, as you would expect. That's, I mean, that's, that's really, I didn't realize how tied to the body this was. I mean, it seems to be like kind of a tit for tat punishment for this one, one soul or right right yeah we think of them as you know these like in imagined spaces but they're both imagined and real yeah for late ancient people that that's really cool that's uh that's you know i and also that that also takes us to the end of our time and i think that's a phenomenal mm-hmm. point to end on um a bit of a revelation for me so that was very cool um, <laughs> so again thank you so much for coming out and joining us tonight um and thank you to all of our attendees for making it out this evening um yeah. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. I suppose, would you be okay with individuals? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, email, tweet, Facebook, send me your questions. <laughs> I'm happy to answer. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everyone.